It's a Monday morning, and we are back here live and ready to roll on Breakfast Central. And it feels really good, even though all of things are quite otherwise, that it doesn't um, look like it's a work day. I know in your mind. In my mind, I want to be in bed. Mind. I want to be sleeping, but I really love our audience so much that I thought if I'm sleeping, wow. my heart to be broken at the thought Oof. that we wouldn't be here to bring them some of the Ouch. latest on Nigerian news. Jay. So I figure that my sleep is not as important mm. as coming here to do mm. my job, mm. which mm. gives me Word. immense joy. Word. Yes. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us. We, of course, are excited, very excited to be here with you on uh, Easter Monday. Happy Easter. We hope that you've had a wonderful celebration. And uh, it's interesting to see here in Lagos that the roads are not as choked oh, as they typically will yeah. be. The traffic will resume again tomorrow. Mm. But it's great to have this mini break that we're exper experiencing. For the next two hours, we're looking at some of the biggest stories here in Nigeria, looking at the political landscape and some of very interesting uh, points to highlight. My name is Olive Emodi. And I'm Joe Hansen. And no doubt uh, this uh, Monday morning, um, it's going to be a mix of uh, a mixture of um, the big stories, what's really happening, and uh, things that affect you as a Nigerian, or better still, as one who lives here in Nigeria. Um, some of the biggest stories uh, this past weekend had to do with the fact that a lot of people came out to celebrate um, Easter, and then there were conversations over the cost of living. Um, if you took a trip down to the market space, regardless of the cost, you still see cars parked people would always find a way. And um, someone then said, it is because of this act of wanting to find a way that makes the government feel, don't worry, they will cope. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with you because during this Easter celebration, a number of people still, I mean, it, it, it's, I think this so far has been our hardest Easter yet. Our hardest Easter because we're still buying fuel at over 600 now, which we've never bought before. And that has, of course, reflected on the price of goods and services. It's also our hardest Easter yet because of the cost of the exchange rate. Yes, good news, the Naira had gained some strength. Um, at the time, at my last check, I think it was about 1,200 and yeah. something, yeah. which is record-breaking with what we've been seeing in the past few months. So, uh, okay. Uh, one thing is we don't expect that there will be an automatic reflection of the strength of the Naira in goods and services. It will take a while before that can be translated down yeah. to smaller uh, units. So yeah, it was really an expensive Easter. Not a, not a lot of people had food to eat. But somehow, the Nigerian people have a resilient spirit such that when things are hard, it almost feels like you push Nigerians back. They're like, okay, there's space behind the wall. We just find a way to adapt. We find a way to to feed them, you know, and I just hope that one day the people will not, you know, revolt. That, that, that's a wish that many people also wish doesn't happen. But then again, uh, the heat wave in Lagos, oh my in goodness. Nigeria, is a conversation everyone has been talking about. I don't know how, if you're feeling it from where you are, Olive. It's terrible, Joe. Pathetic. I don't think that I've ever felt this much heat in my entire life. Too much. I know what's sad. What's sad is, as I'm speaking with you now, I have somebody servicing my ACs at home because the ACs at home don't, don't seem to be cooling anymore. It feels like I turn it on in the daytime and the air is hot. So it's just a, it's a very tough time. And <laughs> you know, the annoying thing about this is, is that it makes me start to feel sick. Mm -hmm. It makes me less productive. Mm -hmm. I'm not able to work. I'm not yes. able to think straight because I'm feeling... My sister touched me and said, why is your body hot? I said, my sister, is the heat. It's the heat from inside that is yeah, finding expression on the outside, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it's, it's a really, really hot and turbulent time here in Nigeria. We hope that people are finding a way around it. At least if, there's, if you're dealing with the heat, I hope you have power in your house. Mm. I mean, if there is no power, I hope you have water so you can be entering into the bathroom every three hours yeah. to pour water on yourself and lie on the tile in your house, whatever the case. We're hoping that we can get out of these really, really tough times. We have um, Adebola Ade Dubba who is bringing us breakfast headlines. Good morning, Adebola. Happy Easter. And uh, how would you say the celebration was for you? Ah, good morning, Olive and Joe. Happy Easter Monday. Yes, we're here again, like every day. Uh, well, celebration so far, I, I feel to a large extent, uh, like I, was, I went to the market, we don't see lots of people, you know, in the market scene, trying to purchase things. I feel it's rather on a very somber mood. 
uh, inflation has you know moved up to 31 percent from 29 percent definitely it is telling on the purchasing power of the average nigerian so i think it, it's more or less on the low key in terms of you know purchasing food items on the market yeah so that's, that's right i mean the purchasing power will continue to to dwindle to continue to go down because what you would get to see then is the fact that a lot of nigerians are afraid that the middle class are about to be removed completely. Is there any middle class again? I, well, you still thing. have, I, I would say there is, but in percentage, if the middle class was about 94.5 uh, before this administration, I would say the, the middle class would come down to about maybe maybe 24.8 now. Well, um, I, I would like, I'd like for us to get you know data regarding yeah. that because mm -hmm. right now it just feels like there are just two classes, the upper class and mm -hmm. the lower class. It feels like the middle class, they're barely surviving. Everyone is just pulling at straws. You know, it's just, it just feels like it's a really turbulent time. But for me, I would say that what, what is helping me, and what is keeping me going is my faith. Because it's faith <laughs> that sort of rekindles my hope and helps me to hope for a life other than the one faith that I have here. Works. Yes, it that, is dead. That, that, but I would rather have faith than experience my current reality and be depressed about it. Now, talking about current reality, just to chip in there, there was some sort of report on Saturday that the state warehouse in Kebi State was looted. Uh, food items were looted by, you know, by people there in Kebi State. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just crazy. Uh, just in January, we had a case of uh, state government warehouse being looted in Abuja. We also have similar cases happening in uh, Niger State where trucks of food items were looted. And then we're having Kebi State again, having similar stories of state, house, you know, state warehouse being looted of food items. I mean, that just tells you how the average Nigerian is grappling with the rising prices of, of goods and services. I mean, I really don't know what can be done to alleviate the sufferings, but it seems Nigerians have been pushed too far to the wall, and I'm hoping something is done pretty soon before things just degenerate further. All right. Anyway, we'll just hold on and hope, after all, the president says that nobody uh, should curse Nigeria. You could talk about the bad leadership. But don't curse Nigeria because Nigeria is a blessed nation. I mean, he did say this um, just uh, a few days ago. But I mean, uh, he's re echoing the words of Tu Baba in his song when he said, Who God has blessed, no man can curse. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Never give another man. <laughs> you just have to be happy, you see. That's the truth. Anyway, Dibola will join you again for the breakfast headlines. But first, let's bring to you what our top stories will look like today. Edo State impeachment panel to sit on April 3rd. That's one of the big stories that's making the headlines. Philip Shaibu is getting it hot. Mm -hmm. And over to Kaduna State, no salaries due to incurred debt. The son of the former governor is slamming the current governor. We'll be looking into that shortly. So, of course, for accountability over borrowed funds, he's talking to the uh, FCT and, of course, other state governors. Inflation, Nigerians decry poor Easter celebration, of course, as a result of the increase in goods and services and we bring you the newspaper front pages this morning all these on breakfast central right after we have breakfast headlines hello and welcome to breakfast headlines here on new century tv i am adebola adeduga Let's begin by telling you that President Bola Tinubu has congratulated my Christians in Nigeria and around the world as they celebrate the Easter season. Easter is an event that commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It also symbolizes Christ's victory over sin and death. To mark the day, President Tinubu in a statement called on Christians to imbibe the virtues of love, sacrifice and compassion associated with the season. The chairman of the All Progressives Congress Caretaker Committee in River State, Tony Okocha, has knocked some chieftains of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in the state over a recent declaration of support for President Bola Chinebu and Governor Sinalaye Fubara. This came as a direct reaction to a press conference by the former national chairman of the PDP, Uche Sekundus, the former Minister of Transportation, Abiye Sekibu, among others, who declared their support for Tinubu and Fubara. While addressing the press conference at the National Secretariat of the party in Abuja, Okocha said most of all those PDP elements are still in Atiku's camp. Away from that, the River State's police commander has paraded a heavily sent 25 other suspects 
arrested for a series of car thefts and other criminal activities across the state. The suspect were paraded at the state police headquarters on Moscow Road in Port Harcourt. The state commissioner of police, Olatsun Jidiso, said the suspects are responsible for about 79 cars stolen from the state. The news continues in Southern Africa, where two people died and almost 2,000 were left homeless when fire engulfed hundreds of shacks in three separate incidents in South Africa's Cape Town. In Johannesburg, at least 60 shacks have been destroyed, leaving hundreds homeless. It is understood that a blaze swept through the informal settlement early on Sunday morning at Commissioner Street, Fairview. In East Africa, Somali state of Horns Land has announced it would no longer recognize federal institutions after Parliament backed a plan for a one-person, one-vote election system. It was the latest move in a long-running and sometimes tense saga with Pontland repeatedly issuing similar declarations in recent years to express disagreements with the central government in Mogadishu. As a result, Pontland will have its own comprehensive government authority until a federal government system is in place the mutually accepted Somali constitution that is subject to a public referendum. In the north of the continent, Algeria President Abdel Majid Tebon has left the question of whether he would stand for a second term in the early presidential elections in September 7. Algeria will hold early presidential elections in September, three months ahead of schedule. Tebon has not said if he will seek a second term in office, and there was no immediate explanation on why an early presidential election has been called. More than 1,000 demonstrators took to the streets of central Tunis to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. The event marked Palestinian Land, Land Day, an annual commemoration of a deadly 1976 crackdown on protest against Israeli land seizures. And that's a wrap on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Olive and Joe. Thank you so much, Adibola Dedupa, for these stories. I think the one that caught my attention are the car thieves. Um, it's just normal that these things will continue to increase, especially when you live in a community or a country that's battling with uh, insecurity, rise in the cost of living, and you could also rightly say a lot of uh, youths just wandering around having nothing to do. It's not because most of them don't want to work, but when you are idle, vices like this uh, tend to become your focus and that's exactly what we're seeing there but i did follow the interview and showed the herbalist was one who got me thinking if you're a herbalist uh, anyway I, I think i'll leave that for later on in the news when our viewers join us uh, for the uh, news bulletin i'm sure they will get more information on that particular story thank you very much adibola for bringing us the news uh we'll see you again at 9 a.m you're welcome oh. Well, um, it's just also a reminder for us that at this point, people now need to start investing in insurance for their mm. cars and their properties because there unfortunately will be a, an increase in the attempted um, in the attempts to steal cars. Because yeah. people are looking. That's not to excuse, right? Greed is not a. Uh, I mean, it's not. It's not like we're excusing crime. There will never be an excuse that's good enough for crime. But it's almost a no-brainer to see that where there is difficulty with maintaining a decent life, there would be an increase in the crime rate. Okay. So I, I think that that's something to look at. And it, it, it reminds me, Olive, what happened in America, where a residents were advised to not lock their cars. Uh, I can't recall the states now, but you, all residences were advised, when you come back home, leave your car key on the door and go to your house. Why? Because they saw a surge in burglary, in attempted murder, thieves would come to your house and request that you give them the car keys. And if you don't, they would attack you. So the police officers just came out to the community in a press release. There was a press release and they said, listen, residents, when you come back home, leave your car open, leave the key at the door going to your home. And I was like, okay. So everyone was like, wait, well, what, that's what, what, this is an, you're actually giving credence to the armed robbers carrying out, it was, it was neither here nor there, but... I'm just saying, we, we, we don't want to get there. We don't want to get there. Indeed, we don't want to get we there. Want. We have more stories that we're going to be looking at this morning, but we'll first go on a quick break, and when we come back, there's more to come.
Christians in Abuja have called on fellow Christian faithful nationwide to embrace the spirit of forgiveness as part of the Easter celebration. This was as they tripped out en masse to mark the Easter Sunday, saying, the current economic situation in the country will not dampen the mood of the special Christian celebration. Amadin Uyi visited the Family Worship Center in Abuja and tells us more. They had converged with the dance and celebration. The church was filled as Christian faithful trooped out en masse to mark the Easter celebration. After spending time with the dance and music, there was a drama playlet to remind Christian worshippers of the essence and significance of the Easter celebration. Easter basically is to celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came and died on our behalf so that we will have salvation. By his death and his resurrection, by his death he's, he paid for our sins, taking our place for the penalty of sin, which was death. The key message of the day revolved around forgiveness to one another, promoting peace and harmony. The pastor of the church gave reasons why. The first thing God did, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he forgave us first, even before he came and died in our, in our place. And for us as human beings, the best thing that God expects us to do is to replicate everything that he has done in our lives to other people. Other members of the church also had a word for their fellow Christian believers, but this time to all Christian faithful around the country. This is the time for everyone to actually forgive people, love them as Christ has loved us, you know, so that's what I want every Christian to go on with today. The, the world alone, the thing, things are difficult right now, but the only solution is Jesus Christ. Okay? Let's just embrace him. This Easter period is the time that he died for our sake, for the love that he has for us. He came and died, gave himself for us. Unforgiveness is a bondage, so you forgive people and show people love. What we preach is love. The summary of the characteristics of Jesus Christ is love. Say love your neighbor as you love yourself. So share love to people around you. That's the starting point of a Christian. They should keep sticking to God. They should look up to him because at all time, his love is permanent and unconditional. Many of them say despite the economic hardship being experienced around the country, this will not dampen their celebration. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Thank you very much, Amadine, for that uh, report showing the Easter Day celebration. Now, still talking about Easter celebration and the impact the Nigeria's economy has had on the Easter celebration, we have New Central correspondent Chinwe Ugele, who joins us this morning. Good morning, Chinwe. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. All right. Chinwe, first of all, happy Easter. How have the celebrations been where you are? Where are you, where are you at the moment, Chinwe? I'm in Umahia, the other state capital. Great. Happy oh. Easter to you. Happy Easter to you. So, well. um, it's been uh, a joyous mood, you know, for the people, especially Christians, because what they are celebrating is the resurrection of Christ. And you know, that is the whole essence of Christianity, salvation. So, if there wasn't um, resurrection, the birth of Jesus Christ actually would have come to naught. So um, it is the resurrection of Christ that makes Christianity what it is. So it is the, the, the root, the foundation of Christianity. And that is why um, Christians are celebrating. So the mood here is that of a celebration. And of course, you know, today is also um, a public holiday nationwide. All right. Um, well, we've looked at the essence of um, the Easter celebration in totality, but one key area that everyone seems to be talking about is the cost of living, the cost of goods, uh, food prices soaring very high. Can you give us a, a, a clear story or indication on what it's like, especially there in the southeast, when it comes to Easter celebration and what the economy is saying today? Usually um, during every celebration in the east, 
you know, there's um, this uh, hike in price of goods and services. Um, you go to the market to buy food stuff. Your food stuff. You under, You now notice that it is a bit higher than what it used to be. It's been high. We've been having this issue of uh, increment in uh, prices of everything, but once it gets close to festive period, it increases even more. So it, it, it's a situation where people have to deal with um, what they see. But then one th interesting thing about this whole issue of uh, inflation and cost of food and all that is that people will always find a way around it. They will always buy the things, even if they increase uh, trade times or, you know, uh, 100%, they'll still purchase those items. It's something that is a norm. It happens during Christmas. It happens during Easter. Even when uh, uh, Muslims are celebrating, I think it's the same situation. So festivity, festivities come with lots of uh, increments in prices of goods and commodities, especially in the Southeast. But the, uh, whilst I understand the regular increase that the festivities bring, is there a role that the current uh, economic climate has to play in terms of the increase uh, in plum price of petrol, as well as the exchange rate that is still fluctuating. And currently, I, I mean, at the last time I checked, it was within the sphere of 1,200 now to 1,300 now to the dollar. Would you say that this has had any impact on the purchasing power of Nigerians in uh, Umwahia? You know, the elite and the educated will play around words and tell you stuff about the economy, how um, the subsidy removal has impacted on the purchase of food items and then the forex, you know, go, uh, fluctuating here and then. But then the um, common person, the ordinary man on the street does not understand all of that. What has Gary, that you get cassava from the farm, got to do with forex? What has it got to do with, you know? But then the traders will also tell you that um, it is how it is because they, 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 they use transportation to, you know, to go purchase those things. So the people who produce, who naturally produce these commodities will increase or will add the cost of transportation, which has actually gone up. Because whether we like it or not, the removal of petrol subsidy affected a whole lot of things in Nigeria, not just in the Southeast. So people, whatever you do, you look at that. So if you were um, spending uh, about 1,000 naira to get to the market, to buy all this stuff, and then you this time around you spend one thousand um, two thousand five hundred naira. It is definitely going to tell on how you're going to sell those commodities. So that is the situation of things. That is what people are uh, uh, dealing with right now, and it keeps it doesn't. It's not static. It's not the same. Each time people go to the market, is a different ball game. So uh, the situation is something. Uh, there's there doesn't seem to be any kind of regulation as to what actually happens. Because truth be told, um, we agree things have gone up. But I think also that the middlemen are doing a lot by increasing, you know, uh, um, uh, how will I put it now? Out, in, out of place. It's too much, the increments they put there. Because when you look at it from the uh, real point of view, you understand that the manufacturers don't increase so much. But then when it gets to the middlemen, they add a lot. And then it gets to the retailers who now add even more. So the person who gets to suffer it most are the end users, the consumers. And this is um, not a very good situation as it were, because if nothing is done to regulate how they increase all the, uh, pri not the prices of goods and commodities, people will continue to suffer and it will tell on the economy of every family. Hmm. That's, a, that's um, a right way to put it, helping us to take a look at, um, at the aspects. I've also had worries about the middlemen, uh, because whether you like it or not, uh, if the prices are coming from the, either the depot or from the production house, the warehouses, once it gets to the middleman, uh, the prices uh, tend to change at a very huge percentage margin. Well, let's talk about um, how it's being celebrated there in the southeast. Down here uh, in, the, in the west, uh, southwest, um, you do have a lot of persons who go to church and also like we saw in the Federal Capital Territory in that report where Amadine Uyi did go to the church, you did see a lot of uh, persons who gathered, uh, that's how it started. And then later on, we do understand in the evening, the beaches are filled up with people who uh, turned that celebration into one that will see family members gather together. 
in the East. Is there any difference uh, if there is? <laughs> There's so much difference. People always go to the church in the morning. Uh, you know, um, like I did say yesterday when I joined live, um, a lot of services and masses we are held across the state in different denominations. And then in the evening as well, we do not have so much, um, we do not have parks around, at least in Abia State, we do not have such parks. So people go to fun centers like um, um, eateries, you know, to go uh, spend time with families, and then uh, visit um, loved ones, you know. There are also people who used yesterday, being Easter, to um, do a lot of charity work. They visited some less privileged homes and, uh, you know, did uh, some charity work there. So uh, it's all about, remember, the Easter celebration is also about almsgiving, forgiveness, and um, being uh, resilient in your faith as a Christian. Mm. Very interesting uh, conversation we've had so far. So good. Well, we'll continue to see uh, what other states uh, did and what today will look like, especially now that you have a lot of people who will and would be rested. Thank you for joining us, uh, Chingwe. Thank you for indeed sharing with us what's happening over there in the East. Thank you. All right. Okay, so there are a lot of conversations around this. And um, here in Lagos, like we rightly said, uh, we did see a plethora of activities here and there. Well, let's also tell you that um, we do have more information concerning um, Easter. And uh, our correspondent, Bettina Nguyeli, also decided to check out what it was like in Lagos. Uh, Bettina Nguyeli, uh, indeed, uh, brings us this package. Whether through solemn rituals or joyful gatherings, Easter is a time when Christians reflect on life's blessings and spread love and good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection. However, in many places, most people concentrate more on the celebration than the reason for the season. Easter is simply about the reason for why we are Christians. I mean, um, without um, Easter, basically, the whole essence of our faith is not there. I think the present generation has lost it. And sometimes I look at it like maybe we should be blamed um, because um, the essence of Easter is for us to look at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what he really stood for and what he did for us, and then lend our life, give ourselves to him, and be obedient unto him. But what we see is that people are now celebrating, dancing, jumping, drinking, doing things. Instead of even being a sober time where you look at your life and you dedicate yourself to Christ. Usually a time to merry and jolly, especially after the long fast. This year, the economic hardship in Nigeria seems to be biting harder than ever, leaving the faithful clinging to nothing but their faith and hope for a better tomorrow. In our own little way, we do our bits. I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, in our neighborhood here, the whole of the jack on the here got pulled down. Of course, who, who, who takes the blunt is the church. These are uh, church where they come. We've had to do, we have to, to support them with funds to relocate. We, every Sunday, we are giving people food stuff. So, we are doing the bit. We expect the government to do their bit. This is is okay for the economy. Uh, it's only it's, it's only by God's grace for everything. The hardship is too much. This time of Easter, there's so much customer in doing our work and everything. The economy has nothing to do with my Easter because I'm of Christ and because I belong to Christ. Nigeria's economy has nothing whatsoever to do with my Easter. Christians in Nigeria are having a low-key Easter celebration this year. No thanks to the current economic hardship in the country that has triggered high cost of foodstuff as well as the soaring cost of transportation for holiday travelers amongst other factors. It is hoped that just like the seasons, this too shall pass. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili.
Thank you very much, Bettina, for that package. Of course, again, once again, we say Happy Easter to all Christian faithfuls around the world who are celebrating Easter. One thing I noticed here in Lagos as well with the Easter celebration is, uh, the, I mean, I don't know if that was the case for the most part of the day, but there was a lot of traffic at some point. Of course, that's because people were going to and from the churches. But then again, I would say that one thing that helps a lot of Christians, even at times in times like this, some people call it religion and call it a religious, uh, what's the word? But, you know, they, they say people are being brainwashed by religion. But I think that there's something about the faith that gives people hope. Hope to dream and desire and expect that things will get better. And I, I you know, would like to say that without hope, you have already lost half of the battle of living. If you were to look at the current grim reality that we're faced with in Nigeria, right? Uh, without hope, I don't know what's left to be able to hold on to. So I, I think yesterday was more of a celebration of hope. Hope, according to Christians, of the, a life after here. And hope that even in this life, that, you know, things, there's something to look forward to other than the current systems of government. According to, you know, the Christian faith will tell you that the systems of this world will fail you. But there's something to hope on, to hope, you know, to look forward to, to hope to, and that's God. So, um, once again, we say congratulations to all Christians around the world celebrating Easter. Personally, I'll say this is my most celebrated Easter. Mm. And I never really uh, celebrated Easter as much before now. Not because I didn't understand the importance of Easter, because I do think that of all the many celebrations that we have in the Christian faith, Christmas, New Year, and all those things, the core of Christianity is Easter. So I think it should be the most important celebration that Christians should have, because that's what defines your faith. But this is the first year that I can say that the importance of Easter weighed upon me so heavily. And I'm really glad to have been able to celebrate Easter with, not just in church, but with family and friends. And our heart goes out to people who are mourning at Easter. We must not forget that even as we celebrate Easter, there are people here in Nigeria whose loved ones are in the IDP camps, who are also themselves in the IDP camps. There are people here celebrating Easter whose loved ones have been kidnapped. And they're looking for how to get money to pay for their ransom or hoping for the best. There are people here in Nigeria who are celebrating Easter but don't know where their next meal will come from. And our hearts, our thoughts and our prayers go out to you and to the Nigerian government. We hope that in the next, by the next Easter that Nigerians will have an Easter to remember because our lives would have drastically improved from what the current reality is. We're going to break now and when we come back we'll be looking at some more stories this morning on Breakfast Central. The Chief Judge of Edo State, Justice Daniel Okumbua, has constituted a seven-man panel to investigate the allegations leveled against the State Deputy Governor, Philip Scheibo, by the State House of Assembly. The panel will commence sitting on Wednesday, the 3rd of April. According to George Odidi, the Administrative Secretary of the panel, the panel would hold its sittings at Judges Conference Room, New High Court Complex, Benin City, at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. In view of the impeachment, the embattled deputy governor, who is currently having a running political battle with Governor Godwin Obaseki following the announcement of his intention to vie for the office of the governor of the state, has approached an Abuja Federal High Court asking the court through an ex parte motion to restrain the assembly, the CJ, and his principal, Governor Godwin Obaseki, from taking further action on the impeachment process pending the determination of the substantive matter before the court. The court presided over by Justice James Omotosho, however, turned down the request, but granted the request that the parties be served by substituted means. It adjourned the matter to April 15, 2024. Uh, we, of course, have seen that it's a non-ending battle for Philip Shaibu. Uh, he's tried and tried to protect himself. This is not the first time he's made allegations of being impeached, but for now, it, it's starting to look real. If you re recall, last year, he had gone to the court to get an injunction refraining the governor from, or, you know, I think it was, yeah, refraining mm -hmm. the governor from embarking on impeachment, an impeach impeachment move against him. Um, it's, it's been chaos, really, in Edo State, with Philip Shaibu, with uh, Godwin Obaseki, that don't seem to see things eye to eye, from being uh, seemingly disrespected in a public gathering to uh, Philip Shaibu demanding or 
feeling in a way, some would say entitled to the support of Godwin Obaseki, saying that during Godwin Obaseki's campaign, he threw the full weight of himself and his influence behind Godwin Obaseki and feels that now that he, it's time for him to run, that he would expect the same level of support from Godwin Obaseki. On the other hand, Godwin Obaseki thinks that Philip Shaibu should give it a rest. You've been a deputy governor, you've tasted power at the highest level of the state, or maybe the second highest level in the state. For eight years, it's time to have a fresh face and fresh hands, to which Philip Shaibu vehemently refuses. So it's really battle that doesn't seem to be going in favor of Philip Shaibu, to be honest. It just feels like every day he's having one battle after the other, while he's conquering one, another one is emerging. Uh, the, the people of his party, I don't know if they really like him at this point. <laughs> there are some people, I mean, we saw the uh, elections, the party primaries that happened, and how he demanded to get the return certificate, to get the um, certificate from the party to, determine, to say that he, of course, is now the official flag bearer for the party at the gubernatorial elections, but unfortunately, you know, that didn't happen. Sir, uh, he, was, he was also on the INEC list as well even though he did have a parallel you know, election. election that um, saw him go all the way to Abuja to get his uh, certificate of return, of which many wondered who conducted the elections. Anik also got, went ahead to say that, um, that, election, that election, the process was not one that they would have um, you know, supported either or would have followed closely. But then again, the, the major issue simply is this. If... Philip Schwabu is going to be impeached. It will start on Wednesday, although there are core um, believers that he will be impeached. There, there, are, there are people who believe that it will happen. Um, Philip Schwabu had already seen this ahead of time. Uh, the comrade had already calculated if it will happen. Uh, that's why he had gone ahead to the court to get the court injunction to stop uh, the current and sitting governor, uh, the exiting governor, uh, from doing that. But now as it stands, it's like it's a no-brainer. It could actually take place. And uh, it, Wednesday is just around the corner. Two days from now, um, we're going to see uh, the sitting. And after that sitting, a lot of pronouncements are expected. But then again, also bear in mind that um, uh, Philip Schreiber's aide uh, had come out a few days ago to say that they did not see the impeachment notice. That was served to him. That's why they've done the substituted uh, service. Know. That's why the court has allowed them to do a substituted service. Yes. Because if you are evading service, there is no way you can say that you haven't seen about seen it in the papers. That's so they've it. done three three national dailies. They've put the they've served officially through uh, the platform of the three national dailies. Some people have criticized Philip Shaibu's doggedness. You know, while some call it doggedness, they've criticized it because they say it's founded on the premise of feeling like he's entitled to power and that it's his turn to run for office. So because I supported you, you must support me back. Mm -hmm. And it's my turn, even if my party says that they do not want me to lead. So some have outrightly criticized this as an entitlement mentality that is, you know, one that we see across different levels of power in Nigeria. Some have also crit criticized the incumbent uh, governor, Governor Godwin Obaseki, who has... Well, he will say he hasn't thrown his weight behind Aswe Gudalu because he says it all the time. People infer that Aswe is his chosen candidate. He says it all the time that Aswe is not a, a chosen candidate as he does not have the power to choose for the people of Edo State who should be their governor. But we see that you know he, he's firmly behind Aswe Gudalu because the party is behind Aswe Gudalu. I, I watched an interview where he talked about how Whilst he can't say that he's behind any particular aspirants, but he can say that Aswell is the one person who had gone to all the local government areas in Edo State, who had spoken mm -hmm, to the delegates, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that he had put in the work. Uh, so some have accused Godwin Obaseki of being an undercover godfather without being you know, out there with it. So both, both of them have criticisms leveled against them. Godwin Obaseki, on the one hand, has criti criticisms leveled against him. Philip Shaibu has criticisms leveled against him. At the end of the day, uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the odds are in favor of Philip Shaibu, regardless, because the voice of the people and the, you know, is the voice of God, like they say, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. But right now, the voice of the people, in this case, being their political party, are tilting more towards Aswe Gudalo as opposed to him. Uh, so I don't know how that is going to turn out for him. Uh, it's just a very, you know, at what point does he now rest is, is another issue. He's, 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 there's no sleep for Philip Shaibu as we speak now, mm -hmm. because... 
uh, there's no one who's going to go through this process and then he will just go to bed and sleep. He's, he's actually sleepless at this point, and we can say that for sure because you do recall that as well, a few weeks back, you did have the people of um, Esaka, uh, Esaka West local government who protested. They did, came, they did come out to protest. And they, they, they protested. They said um, uh, any charges leveled against Felix Shaibu should be dropped. You did have the mothers who also came out. You also had the Catholic Archbishop. They also joined and said, listen, let's ensure that Edo State is peaceful. Let Philip Schreiber still run. But then again, it's looking very, very clear that he, he, this race is a, is, a, is, a meaningless, is a meaningless race where I think he's running backwards as regards running forward. Because one, the list is out. Alec has brought out the list. You are not there. Secondly, you are trying to run a race where you now have an impeachment notice placed uh, before you. And the impeachment sitting will start on Wednesday, two days from now. What hopes do you have? You've tried going to the Federal High Court in Abuja to obtain or to ensure that that impeachment process will not hold. But guess what? The Federal High Court says, hey, listen, mm -mm, there's nothing we can do in this case. Now, you also have a major challenge right now. The, uh, the current uh, sitting governor, the outgoing governor, uh, Obaseki, has told you, like uh, he did say in one of the interviews that I saw, he said he had told, he had spoken to everybody, listen, let's take things easy. Um, there were cases where he had said he was forgiven. And you do remember when Philip Shabu said he's not impressed with what the governor is doing, not giving him support that he needed. But from the get-go, it was obvious that you were not going to get this support. But we do appreciate the doggedness when you put up a dogged fight that, listen, I want to fight, I want to be the one. But it's, 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 it's the likely odds shows that you are not the one. There's someone else who's the one. But then again, April 3rd is not far off. I know how this could play out. Likely, if he's impeached and he goes to the court to, see, to, to, to ensure that that impeachment process can be upturned or can be reversed, it's going to take him a number of years for him to actually get that court injunction. And if he goes to court, uh, the elections are not far away. So it means that <laughs> no matter how hard he tries, it, the odds are really and truly against him if we take a look at all the entire process that's actually put before him. But then again, um, the stories are one that we'll continue to follow and monitor closely. Uh, we're supposed to have a guest join us on this conversation. His name Desmond Obaro, a public affairs analyst, who, uh, on a serious note, has been following this issue very, very closely and he wants to come here this morning to equally share with us um, the updates, the latest updates, especially from the uh, from um, Benin, uh, from Edo State, uh, letting us in on what the uh, series of events have been uh, played out, uh, especially looking at uh, April 3rd, which is just on, on Wednesday, and what we are expecting to see. Um, well, sadly, um, we do hear that he's not able to join us any longer. He's tried all his best, but we hope that uh, maybe in the course of the week we'll be able to get, um, uh, possibly, it's a conversation that will continue. Uh, it's a developing story, so most importantly, tomorrow is there, Wednesday is there. Um, we do have our eyes, nose, and mouth it will equally be there. So they'll be joining us to let us know what the situation report simply is. Uh, but currently, one of the most embattled deputy governor in Nigeria now happens to be comrade uh, or you could say His Excellency, or you could say uh, the Deputy Governor himself, Philip Shaibu. He's indeed uh, going uh, through a lot at this point. But right. should one actually go through a lot for just wanting to be the next governor? You know, uh, just thinking out of the box, like, do you really need to go through all of this? So there are two, two sides to that argument. One side is that you pushing so hard might, be, might come off as selfish because mm -hmm. you are seeing a game back with the, it is my right mindset you're seeing it as your right to be in office so one argument against it would be that no it's not that deep um, you've tried people don't want you to rest but another argument would be that sometimes you need to fight for systems you know systems and structures to be broken down systems and structures that are not in favor of you know the right thing you need to fight for them to be broken down so to be honest, I don't know which side it is for Philip Shaibu, but we wish him all the best and we'll be following up with that. And just to mention that the governorship candidates have been announced by INEC in Edo State governorship candidates uh, and their deputies, about 17 of them, have been announced in Edo State. And we'll be bringing more updates. And on a sad note, I don't know if you heard 
of the man who was killed by a headsman in uh, Edo State. Uh, I'll just quickly double check his name. Uh, he was killed by suspected headsman, yes. In no former Gabriel, he was killed at his farm in Jatu community, the headquarters of uh, Uzairue clan in Esako, West local government area mm. of Edo State. And this happened last week, Wednesday. It's just very sad, you know, to, to bring that update. This is again to remind us that we are not far from the struggles or the, the challenges that insecurity brings in our country. And whilst they're facing it in the north, you know, different portions of the country, like it's, it, it's spread into different portions expressed as kidnapping, expressed as terrorism, banditry, insurgency, you know, on insurgency and unknown gunmen and all the different terminologies under the umbrella of insecurity. It's a challenge that we're having. And we're hoping that it's not something that rears its ugly head up during the election. Because we see a lot of that happening during the elections as well. But our heart, our thoughts and our prayers go out to the family of the disease. And we hope that investigation is being conducted so that the perpetrators of this dastardly act will be brought to book. That's all that we have for this first half. We'll take you through a recap of the stories we've looked at this morning as we share with you what's coming up next on uh, Breakfast Central. We spoke about, uh, we have still to come, Cardinal State, no salaries due to incur incurred debt. It was something that we talked about in the news and uh, something we'll still further talk about. Inflation, Nigerians decry poor is the celebration. Chimwe Gele and Bettina Willi gave us reports and we've just concluded the conversation on a do state impeachment panel, which is set to sit on the 3rd of April. The committee, seven-man committee, has been instituted by the Honorable uh, CJ. We'll bring you more details on that. But coming up next, we have newspaper front pages that we'll be reviewing with our guest analyst. And Sarah calls for accountability over borrowed funds. Whether the accountability call will be answered is what we don't know. And we wrap up by bringing you which way Nigeria where we ask the questions that matter. Thanks for joining us here on Breakfast Central. The 8 o'clock hour, which happens to be our second hour, we start off with the front pages to see what the newspapers are saying. And let's start off with our very first paper, but not until we introduce to you our guest in the studio. We do have joining us the CEO of Kish Global Consultant, a company focused on leadership and followership, of course, ensuring that everyone gains and understands how to be a leader. Welcome, Dr. Tai Wojo. Happy Easter and um, new month to all our viewers across the world. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So good. Let's go straight to our very first paper this morning. And we will be looking at this Nigeria. This Nigeria has that very, very strong and very powerful um, headline that you can see there. It's one that, um, of course, we touched on early this morning, but it's something that we need to also discuss on that front page there, it says, Angry Youths Loot Palliatives in Kebi as NDLEA seizes consignment of psy psychoactive substances hidden in noodles in Bayelsa. <laughs> Niger Delta Leader Sutunibu, Wiki will remain your dependable ally. FCT Minister inspects six road projects on Easter. Um, that's, uh, those are some of the key stories. Let's take a look at another one. Salute the Lords, Air Pieces, Direct Lagos, London Flight. BDC's return to mainstream FX markets responsible for exchange rate stability, Abcon. And then uh, we'll take the final ones. APC Chieftain, Lukman, calls for reconciliation between El Rafai, Kaduna Governor. Uh, you know that story, of course. Kaduna Governor saying he's not able to pay salaries. I'm talking about, um, uh, yes, Governor Sani. Uh, well, another one. Please confirm kidnap of three students from Unical Hostel. Wow. Let's start off with angry youths looting palliatives <laughs> in Kebi. Kind of like a mm. reminds you of what took place in 2020 uh, during the COVID-19 uh, period. Um, I, I, I always want to start with good news. Honga you know? <laughs> is a big deal now. And um, the global... Uh, turbulence across the world is a big deal also. But oftentimes, we come back home, our own is more of a self-inflicted injury because so many things happen, there's so many policy directions of the government, sometimes painful, but our, the biggest task we have as Nigerians, you know, everybody look up to the leader, that the leader must solve every problem. 
as we were coming this morning, we waited for uh, traffic light. People did not obey traffic light. So is it the president? You know, so he, 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 maybe our system is one of those issues. But what, one thing I want to talk about is, I want us to focus on the good news. Lagos, London flight. For some of us that are frequent flyers that will travel often, it was a big deal. Because one thing I, I, I understand about the way we Nigerians, we don't normally speak better of our country. We, we dwell on the negatives, which I understand. I know things are very rough for most people now. Even the elites, things are not. Because who travels is the elites. Who pays their children's school fees is the elites. So things are rough for most people now. But we need to look inward and see how can we solve our problem ourselves. You know, when I see the younger news in Kaduna, you know, you, you spoke about COVID. They gave people palliatives, and people just kept the palliatives for political reasons. Two problems that we had as a nation. We are not a nation. Sisti, religious bigotry, and tribalism. You know, someone sent a video to me, was it two days ago, in a church in Dubai. They were breaking Ramadan fast. So they went to break it in, inside the church. And I sent a response back to the person. I said, can they do this one in other Nigeria? Because they see religion as a tool to, to, to dominate and to... And religion is made by human beings. I mean, we have over seven, eight religions. We don't really need religion. We need one-on-one -on -one relationship with the God that you say you, you serve. So I, I just want to... I, one thing I just want to give to us are these good news that we're celebrating Easter. And uh, even our Muslim brothers... They are breaking, they, they will be celebrating Ramadan in a couple of days. It's, we need to look inward. We need to look inward and see how we can solve our problem from within. No one will come outside to solve our problem. All right, mm. but let's look at um, this particular story yeah. here yeah. as well. And let's go about the, um, although it's, it's part of our conversation yeah. that we're going to have later on, uh, the Kaduna State Governor yeah. um, saying that there's a lot of, there was backlog Logs, yeah. of debt. You know, being old, and then um, um, El Rafai uh, didn't pay. What happened was the debt kept tripling mm. in number, and then he sad to say he's not able to pay. To pay. Those things will always happen. You know, in, in leadership, you have four departure star. In leadership, leadership and succession, you have four departure star. You have the governors. Most of the governors, it's not only peculiar to our culture here, most of the governors try to look for a weakling. To hand over power to. And I believe that's what happened in most states in Nigeria. They look for someone, but when the person takes over, power is for only one person. You will see the fight, whether from rivers to Kaduna. Those things are expected. But what do we need to do? You are the governor. Leave the past. You, you, you took over power. Focus on what you need to do. No need to blame any past. Focus on now. And try to solve your problem. That's why they voted for you to come and solve their problem. You can't go back. You know, one person I always try to commend every time, but people always don't want to listen to us. Obasan just took over Nigeria in 1999. We were finishing the university there. Things were so rough. Obasan just did not talk about military. That they spoiled. Obasan just went straight to work, got best, uh, the best team, and see what happens to Nigeria when he left. The only problem is just that he, he failed at the succession. Because the failure of the succession is what we are facing today. The 15 years wasted. Because we had continued on that Obasanjo growth rate in 2007. See now, you know where Nigeria will be now. So we need at every point in time, don't dwell on the past, Mr. Governor. Debt must always be. Everybody go, you borrow money for business. Focus on now. You are the governor. Look for means. You know, I, I'm, I, most often, sometimes, I will look at governors, they'll be calling on president to come and solve their problem for them. Why are we not focusing on our subnational? Why are we focusing on the central? They'll tell you, some, in some situations, they'll tell you that it's matters outside of their... Their control, exactly. their constitutional issue. No. Focus on our governors. Because when we put people that have nothing to offer as a governor, governor, local government, they are the one that is closer to you. Focus on your governor. Leave president. Focus on the governor. All right. We'll continue with the newspaper front pages, but just to mention that if you're watching and you'd like to react to any of the stories that were taking the numbers to call on your TV screen, we want to hear your thoughts. 
please call us and share your thoughts with us. I think the final story we should take from uh, the uh, this day Nigerian newspaper says BDC's return to mainstream FX market responsible for exchange rate stability according to Afcon. We saw that mm. grew the change were touted as the enemy. They were the ones mm. they were chased they chased them out. They said at some point Binance we're not quite sure what the issues have been, yeah. but are you excited or what, what do you think about BDC's returning to mainstream FX market? Uh, you know, uh, as a policy shaper, you know, most of the work we do are not things that you see. You know, and we don't go to social media and, you know, most of what we do is all of us must be blamed. You know, all of us must be blamed. Why are we so fixated on dollar? Why are we so fixated on dollar? You know, sitting down somewhere and destroying your country currency. You know, I had an experience in 2019, you know, just to share with what, you know, I'm a, I'm a research scholar, so we travel across the world, talk to doctoral students, you know, they do their presentation. So three people came to present. And in that committee, I was the only African there. But they don't know, maybe I'm American or they don't know. So they are all Caucasian, Canadian, British and co. So three people came to present. One person from Haiti, another lady from Guyana, and another person from Nigeria. When, we, when they finished their presentation, it was a 30 minutes presentation. The Nigerian guy was speaking about Boko Haram, how Nigeria was so unsafe, you know. I'm not saying what he was saying is right or wrong. The Guyana, you know Guyana is a small country in there. The Guyana, the Haiti, you know Haiti, you know their gang. They spoke well about their country. At the end of the day, when we wanted to grade those uh, scholars, my colleagues looked at me, they said, Prof, you grade your people. You grade them because it's the same culture, so you understand. So what am I talking about? The Nigerian guy could not move. So later, during uh, dinner, I saw him, I called him. I said, well, even if you're an American, you do not speak ill of a country. Because no matter where you are, no matter the passport you carry, you are from Nigeria. Ah, that means you will not like the segment on our show called Which Way Nigeria? No, I will. Because it's not like we're speaking in. <laughs> Ill, but we just call it as in. it is. No, right? Nigeria. Because Niger we say that some of our problems here in Nigeria yeah. is cultural. Okay, well, yes. we, we, we are trained as p young people to say you can't call out wrong when an elder is Of course, it's our wrong. culture. I know. And we see that it has seeped into politics. Yeah. It's how a number of politicians feel that they can do a number of things, pillage our commonwealth yeah. and get away with it. Yeah. And nobody's saying anything yeah. to them. You know, our culture in Africa is very patriarchal. It's a king servant relationship. A king will go somewhere. You can't face the king. Even as a young people, you can't look up to your dad or your mom and say That's something true. to them. But the children of nowadays, there's technology. They just, they, they don't, there's a, there's a confidence in them. But because of where we're coming from, you know, I normally say it, I say, we that we, we grew up in the 70s, 80s, we are not transferring those values to our worlds now. Those values, you might say, maybe there's a little element of fear in those values, but we need to transfer those values to our world. All right. So to, to finish on the BDC, is a good news, but we've not started. We need to take that dollar back to 400. All right, we'll come back we, to that. We, we, hope. we, hope. <laughs> we have Godwin calling we from hope. Calabar. Good morning, Godwin. Please go ahead with your comments. Hello, Godwin. Are you here with us? Or oh, it seems that we may have been disconnected uh, from Godwin. I would hope that you can call back before the newspaper review is over. But yes. The dollar, you're talking about the dollar. So we, we, we want the dollar to go back to fund. Do you think it's possible? It's possible. Let me tell you something. It's possible. We need the political will. Now, every, everyone knows Russia. You know, you, you, we used to call the USSR. Putin came to power in 2001. He was the prime minister to, the, to Gorbachev. When Putin came into power, look at Russia now. They could tell you that Russia is the dictator, but go and look at the, the per capita income. How the country is fairing, they are better. They have over 600 billions in their foreign reserve. And Russians' lives are better. You might say it's dictator. What did Putin do? And I want to put this on to our president. He started well, but it's tough. Call everybody. Putin called all the oligarchs. You know, the people they refer to oligarchs, they benefit from government. He called all the oligarchs. He locked them in a room. And he looked straight to their eye. He said, Russian Federation must move. We must not depend on Europe again. How does the money that you have, that you stock in Switzerland, in Zurich, 
Go and take 70% of those money and bring it back to Russia. And let us develop Russia. That is why you see Russia growing. It, it did not use force. He appealed to them. So the same thing we are uh, talking to our people in Nigeria. That they said they are billionaires. They have a lot of money at home. Stock somewhere. Bring those money in. Let us use our Nigerian products. Yeah, peace is a good sign. But this thing you are saying is sounding like wishful thinking. It's not a wishful thinking. It, it is doable. The only problem is the, is the leadership. Uh, but, leadership uh, by example. But we have people who, who come here to say that political will is all we need and the current administration has political will. You, who, you, you, let me also jump on that. You also have a situation whereby the presidency mm. is preaching by Nigeria. But, but it's they are not. Foreign made, they are be, all right. Foreign Hold that thought. Let's because. hear from Godwin calling from Calabar. <laughs> Good morning, Godwin. <laughs> Thank you for calling back. Please go ahead with your comments. Godwin, can you hear us? Unfortunately, mm. I think um, mm. we're not able to connect with, with uh, Godwin. But then again, like we said, you, you, you preach by Nigeria. But, but of course, the cars that you are purchasing are not... Nigeria made, made, made brands. It's leadership. Yeah, they're, 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 leadership by example. So Ludo did it. You know, sometimes we, we leadership comes that we, we look at someone to go there. When Soludo came in as governor of Anambra State, we have Innocent. So Ludo's official car is Innocent Jeep. But you know the problem we have with most of our political class? I'm sorry to say this one. The, there's this high type of insecurity. They are so insecure and Mat, mat, you know, materialistic. You understand? You be in a position is for you to serve. While you are serving your people, your needs will be met. You know? But it's the opposite. You want to drive jeeps. I'm not saying it's wrong to drive jeeps. But serve your people. Make them better. Let us look inward. Innocent is there. Support innocent. As you are supporting the airpiece, Support Innocent. Let us be driving Innocent. Now that there's no dollar, if you go to Jackson Bay now, all those cars have been there for the past three, four years in Florida. Nobody to import because it's Nigeria that is their biggest market. Now, can we look inward and solve our problem now that there's economic uh, uh, uncertainty everywhere? Can we solve our problem within? It takes guts and leadership by example. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to our next paper. We have the Vanguard newspaper. And let's see what the big stories on the Vanguard are saying this morning. On the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, uh, we're looking at banks' recapital recapitalization. Banks went over exclusion of 3.8 trillion Naira retained profit. Uh, that's what the big story is saying this morning. We also have here um, Easter, OB, governors, others, task Christians on love, sacrifice. Echo Disco, Dr. Tinuade holds fort as NDC. Mm. I don't know if you saw the, saw, the yeah. drama the going drama, on. Back and yeah. forth is a boardroom uh, politics. politics. Is a control. That's our problem here. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, aviation fuel, domestic airlines grown over rising price of Jet A1. NSCIA to governor, stop asking Tinubu to curb insecurity in your states. <laughs> Okwama residents trapped in forests send SOS to Tinubu, Oboyowori. Uh, we have at the top of the paper, Edo Gubernatorial, 16 men, one woman, who want to succeed Obaseki. Mm. Um, Uza, uh, Uza Mere and Eholo Bika over preferred candidates, APC holds stakeholders reconciliation parley, plots winning strategies. Tinubu's aide, Tanko, in verbal war over Peter Obi. Mm. Our leaders behave like men in drunken stupor. No, mm. it's Kuka that said it. Kuka, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <it's in> <laughs> Why Nigeria's oil belongs to the north mm. by Usman mm. Bugaji. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Mm. But let's talk about the update regarding the Okwama residents. Mm. I'm sure you've been following the Okwama story. Yeah. Okwama residents are trapped in forests, sending SOS to Tunubu and Oboriwori. I hope that I can look into the story as well to see what exactly that is. Um, the, the army has been applauded for not carrying out reprisal attacks, mm. even though we've heard in some so corners many stories, yeah. that they were actually yeah. reprisal attacks. You know, why, why, why do we keep repeating history in, in Nigeria? You know, we remember General Basanjo, mm. you remember uh, Zaki Biam in Benway, now Delta. Why, why would you go and kill your military forces? Even if they are doing bunkering, because it's bunkering that they do in, in those areas. It is transactional. You know, everything they do in our culture is transactional. Well, what is the name for me? So the moment transaction comes in, there's danger. You understand? Why will you kill your military men? You know, my condolences to the Nigerian um, uh, 
army and the defense and the, the, the president and the data community. Why do you need to kill your men? So, third time error. We did it in 99, OD, Zaki Biami, maybe 2002 or 2001 in Benway, now in data. Why? We need to try to avoid entering the same error again. And to respond to what uh, Dr. Bugaje said about the North having oil, it's a fallacy, it's a mindset. That is what goes on in the mind of our Northern brothers. Because when, when education is a problem, when you do not want people to be educated to be enlightened, they give you old feebles, old feebles that stand on nothing, that say, you are the owner of Nigeria. Because what did the British do? British come to any territory and do divide and rule, get minority to dominate or majority. Look at all the countries British colonized, from India to all of them. It's only Nigeria that is still a country today. All of them, they've all separated. Because you can't use a minority to rule on the majority. Not even in this time of social media, that there's technology. Every secret that you do, before you leave, someone has already leaked it out. You know, so all those things are fallacy. I did not expect Dr. Bugaje, he's a scholar, he's a PhD, that to be speaking, enlightened person to, to speak like that. They are old feebles. They do not allow for development of a country. Let us develop Nigeria based on justice, based on equity and fair play. And Nigeria will become, like Dr. Adesino said, Change the name of Nigeria to the United States of Nigeria. Do you, but it's you not, agree with that? It's not the name. It's the mind of our people. <laughs> because changing the name feels Does like no, we are no. just changing the package. It's the, the but real the content deal. Has been sorted. Our mindset, the way we think as people, as Nigerians, whether in diaspora, whether in Nigeria, is the same. Okay. Let's go to the next story of Kwama residents. And just to mention, we know that some mm. of you have had challenges with the phone lines. Please don't stop trying. Mm. Call us and share mm. your thoughts. Mm. The numbers to call. Uh, on your TV mm. screen. We want to hear what you think about these stories. Mm. Whatever it is, you consider a mm. really pressing issue yeah. in Nigeria's politics and economy at the time. Mm. Okwama, okay, we've moved away from that. Let's talk yeah. about uh, NSCIA to the governor saying that they should stop asking Tinubu to come mm. and suck out, stop, uh, uh, sort out uh, security. security. You know, I, I will forever be grateful to my former governor, Akire Dolo, you know, and Makinde when they started the Amoteco. You know, the Southwest was under intense prayer on that Buhari then. So what did they do? They did not run to Buhari in Abuja to go solve their problem for them. You are the governor. You think outside the box. And they came with Amoteko. That was all secure the southwestern part. So I want to appeal to those governors in the north. It's not to be sponsoring people to watch. It's not to be giving people money to sponsor people to Saudi Arabia. That is your work. Train your people. Give them education. Let them know between A and B. You know, sometimes it amazes me. I'm a religious scholar. We go to Islamic religion, we go to prison. It doesn't make any meaning. Why do you think people go to Saudi Arabia? People go to Qatar? They go to Dubai? Do you think the Islam is the same with the one we practice there? It's different. Mm -hmm. Because the Islam there is with education. Christian value education. Nobody has the capacity to change anyone except God. So don't, 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 be, fear, don't be fearful. That if you enter church, someone's spirit will arrest you. It's a lie. Go to school. Know the difference between right and wrong. And speaking to our northern brothers, let your people be educated. The issue of this banditry, the issue of this kidnapping, will be a thing of the past. Send your people to school. Focus on education. The same way you train your child. Your girl child, you send them to school in America, in England, a Christian denominated area. Send the children of Alima Jerry. Send them to school. Let them know what real religion means. Let them know the true meaning of Islam that you say you practice. Because the Islam they practice in Saudi Arabia and UAE and uh, Qatar, which is developmental, is not the same Islam that our brothers in northern Nigeria says they practice. So don't be sponsoring your people to arch. Use the money for education. And in the next 20, 30 years, we'll you will see, see the, the change. Right. But, okay. but 20, 30 years mm. seems to be a long time. It's not a long time. Compared, co compared to what we're going through. You know, our culture, we don't plan long. The maximum you can do in this culture is Eastern. It's eight years. No, eight years is too long. Four. So can you, and if you do four years, you might not be able to achieve much. So plan for 20 years. Even when you are left power, 
another person will continue. But there's no continuity as well. No, but That's but another it, problem. It's a problem. It's a cultural problem. I've told there's you. no continuity. So, so somebody, is, a, a governor is trying to uh, Do, start up a project yeah. of a bridge. Oh, yeah. He starts during his four-year mm -hmm. tenure. He leaves. The next another governor person. comes, abandons it completely, and then goes and starts a brand new yeah. project again. Yeah. While he's there for his eight years, it's about to be done. He hasn't finished that project. Yeah. That makes two. He leaves the next one comes, Come. starts a brand new one, and then goes ahead to say they want to re uh, uh, reconstruct this one all over again. That and is where, monies are being. You know, that is where the national vision comes in. Does Nigeria Do have we, a, do no, from, have a from national? No, from what we heard, they is said like national, national, national the national agent, uh, orientation agents they are working on a new value, credo, etc., which they will release in May. One year anniversary of this government, we are waiting. Let us have a national vision. Anyone that gets to power, follow path. You see the way Britain is being run. Whether it's Labour, whether it's Conservative, it's the same goal. They do not have a, a constitution in, in, in United Kingdom. It's based on mouth. But you can't run against what is written, what they agreed. You know, so let us have a national vision that will drive all of us. Whether you are from the north, whether you are from the east or from the west, we know this is where we are going as a people and as a nation. And we need more of unity and compassion now in Nigeria, especially because of the hunger issue. Well, there's hunger in the land, and the Nigerians are, are, are breezing through it. It's tough. Hopefully, hopefully, mm -hmm. we'll be able to get something yeah. done. But then again, let's go straight to our next paper. Our apologies to the phone lines mm -hmm. for those who have tried mm -hmm. connecting and uh, not being able to connect. Uh, let's see, Daily Trust. Kebi residents loot government and private warehouses. Palliatives not solution to hardship by also governor says. Kuka charges to number one food physical security. Uh, that's what you have on mm. the front page there. Mm. Cease fire talks resume as Israel kills 400 Palestinians in two weeks. Mm. 400 in two weeks. Imagine if it goes into mm. four weeks. That yeah. would be 400 mm. uh, times two. Talking mm. about 800 yeah. persons dying in four weeks and you can only imagine what happens mm. if it extends to months yeah debt kaduna apc suspends a women leader for criticizing governor sani it boils down to what we just said when we talked about it here yeah we, we we have a society or a culture yeah. where you, you dare not speak up yeah. to someone or an elder mm. or an older person even mm. when they are doing what is yeah. wrong yeah and and that society has also been the bane of the situation yes, that we that find we ourselves now. in today. Yes. Nigeria records 55.2 billion naira trade imbalance with UK. Easter, ACF urges prayers for security mm. and economy. It reminds me of which way Nigeria. Exactly. Which way Nigeria. Prayer and okay. so on. Mm. But then again, I'd like you to react to either of these stories. Um, mm. The Kebi residents loot. Uh, you did touch on that earlier on. Mm. Um, we also look at the fact that uh, Kaduna is suspending women leaders mm. for talking. Yeah. And then one more that we could also look at is the fact that, um, uh, you know, Kuka is charging President uh, Tunibu on, on food, food and, physical and physical security. security. You know, the greatest problem we have now as a nation is insecurity. No matter your developmental plans, your good strategy, if people are not secure, all those things are nullity. So what do we do to respond to the security issue? You said there's going to be a state police. Let them, let everybody take care of his own state. And so that when you have people that are protecting you, the issue of insecurity will be a thing of the past. About the KB issue, about uh, hunger, you know, breaking palliatives, those things, because survival is the lowest need of a man. And in our culture in Africa, in Asia, India, we are still on the survival need. The lowest level of need. Even our supposedly billionaire, they are still on the on lo, the lowest level of Maslow. Their batteries. Survivor. Because when you are when you are a survivor, you'll be thinking about tomorrow that if the money finishes, what do I do? So you want to amass more. Greed setting. You know, you 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 see the way we run things in Nigeria. It's the same issue we keep on facing every year. About this hunger, about this palliative, about this salary issue, it's the same issue. So what do we do? Let us have a state police. Let every state, so that they don't pass the buck, let them protect their people. The moment you protect your people, and you know, there's so many ungoverned spaces in the north. Most people have not been to, they have been to all northern states. So many ungoverned spaces. It's only the state capital that is secure. And they have over 20, 30 local governments. That there's no single individual. So can you imagine all those terrorists, all those bandits? They just walk freely. It's a fiesta. And that is where our agricultural strength is coming from. 
So they do not have the opportunity to go to farm. So yesterday when I was leading to uh, Mati Kuka, you know, we were saying the truth to power. Let us solve this issue of insecurity. The only secure place in Nigeria is the Southwest. And the people that wanted to tackle Southwest, when Bali was there, they had an agenda. The moment people can travel again from Lagos to, there's a problem. But because of the way our people are, we, people rose to the occasion, and we, Amotekun came to Bain, and they were able to nip it in the north. So I want to recommend those ones to be uh, not Western governor. I was told Sanfara just had his own local, uh, Sanfara had another state in the Kaduna governor. Go and, ask, you go and set up your own. Let every state set up their own local vigilante. The moment you do those things, you secure the life of your people. So all those economic things is secondary. Security first. All right. Dr. Um, Taiwojo, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a very uh, deep conversation. We do appreciate your analysis on some of these uh, big stories that's making the front pages of the newspapers on a Monday morning. The holiday continues, yeah, continue. but not until uh, 24 <laughs> hours <laughs> wraps up. We look forward to having you again, join us. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So we'll go for a quick break. Our next conversation will focus on what you have seen on the front pages of the papers. No money, no salaries. <laughs> Is that really so? After the break, we'll be right back. Over the weekend, Kaduna State Governor Ubasani made a revelation at a town hall meeting that the immediate past administration of Nasir El Rufai left $587 million, uh, $85 billion debt, and 115 contractual liabilities, making it impossible for the state to pay salaries. Governor Sani added that with the rise in exchange rates, the state is now paying back almost triple of what was borrowed by the previous administration. He, however, stated that despite the debt inherited, his administration had not borrowed a single cover in the last month, last nine months, I beg your pardon. Well, following his announcement, a socioeconomic rights and accountability project, Serap has issued a one-week ultimatum to Nigeria's 36 state governors and the minister of the federal capital territory, Abuja, Misanyes Omwike, to account for loan agreements and spending details of some 5.9 trillion naira and 4.6 billion dollars loans obtained by the estates and the FCT including the locations of the projects executed with the loans. Joining us this morning, first, we do have um, Kolawole Oluwa Dare. He's the Deputy Director. Serap, he joins us online, virtually. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for being here this morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for All having right. me here. Okay, and um, uh, we'll also uh, have joining us Mr. Emeka um, uh, Madunagu is a publisher, Metro Star newspaper. He's also, of course, followed this story closely. So that gives us a, 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 a complete look of all of these entire stories coming from Serap and uh, the Borains and the likes. But first off, let's start off with um, uh, Mr. Kola Wale Luadari, Deputy Director Serap. Now you've sued, or better still, you've told the government that they need to speak up and come out with proof. I like to put it that way, because you're giving them an ultimatum. Uh, tell us, um, how possible do you think the government would respond to this ultimatum that you have indeed put forward? Thank you very much. By possibility, by how possible that you've asked, you would be referring to factual circumstances, perhaps based on antecedents of the Nigerian government, including the president. Mm -hmm. um, but I would speak to the uh, issues of law, the basis for which these governors who are public officers should respond. Serap's request is born out of a freedom of information request, which of course is an act of the National Assembly predicated on constitutional provisions that grants Nigerians the right to freedom of expression, which also includes the right to know. So it means that within the context of the law, these governors are compelled to disclose this information. And what we're asking for is not, it's not too much. It is public knowledge, as we've seen in, uh, from the debt management office that and, and all the states in Nigeria have taken up loans ranging from the, uh, billions of naira, trillions of uh, billions of dollars uh, to trillions of naira. Including the Nigerian state, the federal government itself. But what we've not seen, which is the crux of this freedom of information request, is how those loans have been expended. And that is why we're asking these questions. And under the Freedom of Information Act, the uh, public institution has seven days to respond uh, to uh, such requests. It's very simple, really. 
how are these loans being spent? Where are the projects for which they've been spent? Who are the beneficiaries and who are the contractors? And what are the stage of such constructions or, or capital projects on which uh, these loans have been spent? It's just part of the transparency and accountability mechanism that every Nigerian, across all political divides, tribes, and religion, should be naturally interested in. I see no reason why they wouldn't respond to this. Mm. Okay, um, everyone should be interested in it. Um, everyone needs to be involved. Let, let me speak to um, um, our in-house guest, uh, Mr. Amadunagu. I mean, you've also followed through some of these um, um, stories of constructions and so on and so forth being done, neither here nor there. Kind of like coincides with the last conversation we had in the newspaper review about things being constructed, projects being commissioned and not commissioned yet, even though they were approved. Um, can you tell us very closely um, how possible is it for Nigerians uh, to ensure that they can hold government accountable when it comes to projects like these? Yeah, thank you very much. And what Sarap is doing in line with his civic responsibility as a responsible member of the society. And then it also uh, behoves of Nigerians. <coughs> as citizens and um, through um, CSOs, <coughs> to ask you know, questions, not just to take things hook, line, and sinker. The media also has a responsibility to go through its archives and you know, follow up on uh, what had been reported in the past. That is one of the things we were taught as journalists, that you know, follow up is very important. You don't just report a story Okay, you, you, you keep a notebook, and then maybe some months after, you go back to that story to see, okay, what has come out of it? So definitely, the borrowings by these governors have uh, become worrisome, because you're not seeing the impact on the citizens. The governors keep telling you they're doing roads, they're doing bridges, you know, they keep, uh, you know, bu bu building roads, bridges, they keep telling you they're going to build airports and all of this. And too often you find out that these are just uh, uh, funnels for money laundering, you know, for, 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 for looting the treasury, you know, and uh, diverting uh, the nation's uh, scarce resources. And in a time like this, where things, you know, are so difficult for the average Nigerian citizen, you would expect that the governors would have serious plans, you know, for alleviating the sufferings, you know, alleviating the plight of the people. But you still see the governors living in opulence. You still see the governors and carrying on as if you know nothing is happening. And so, what it means is that everybody now blames the central government. Everybody expects that the central government can solve all problems. Whereas you see, uh, with the removal of uh, fuel subsidy, according to records, you know, from the government, more money has accrued to the states. But have we seen more development? The answer is no. Public infrastructure in the states is still at a very is still at an abysmal level. Education is still in many states are still struggling, are still struggling with paying their counterpart funds for you know uh, in education. Health in many states is just non-existent. Healthcare is non-existent. You know security. You know the governors expect that the federal government, because we have a central policing system. You know, the federal government should take over, should just, you know, uh, babysit them, you know, piggyback them and take care of everything about security. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to lift a finger. They cannot be innovative, even with all the resources they have. Okay. So I, okay. I think I, I commend Serap for its uh, latest move. Well, uh, well done once again to Serap, and uh, thank you for constantly holding the government to account. You've given the government a one week, uh, you've given them one week, one week ultimatum. That would be the governors as well as. Uh, the minister of the FCT. Let's talk about Q1. Uh, I'll come back to this ultimatum that you've given, where today begins the second quarter of the year. How would you rate the government's performance so far? And uh, talk to us about some of the work that Serap has done. Uh, we know that you have constantly held the government to account. And talk to us about some of the work you've done in Q1 and you know the feedback that you've gotten from the government. Thank you very much. If I was to rate the government, I wouldn't rate the government there, um, with uh, economic metrics or, or the, the level of infrastructure development. From the point of view of Sarah, given what we do, 
It will be based on transparency and accountability. And that is very important. So it is not about how much government has made and how much they've spent. It is knowing if those funds have been spent effectively and efficiently in terms of the people. You won't understand perhaps this kind of analogy. If someone gets 10 naira, they spent 2 naira, perhaps the people will clap and they'll say he has done well, not knowing that 8 naira has ended up in private pockets. So in this instance, if I was to rate the government, the first quarter that has come, I would rate, perhaps rate them one or two over ten. They have not fared well. And I'm speaking about the president, the president of the federal government and the state government, including the local government in Nigeria. The government has not fared well in terms of transparency and accountability. And given the importance of transparency and accountability to democracy, the practice of democracy itself, and of course the benefits that would accrue to the people by infrastructural development, you would understand that in the absence of these transparency and accountability mechanisms, would have at best will be some sort of tokenism. Government will appear to move and then do things, but because the Indian and other way of what is coming and have another respect, perhaps you might even rate government uh, wrongly to say that they have done well. Very good example. Frank allocations have increased. We've seen it published by the National Bureau of Statistics month after month, last month in February 2024. 1.2 trillion was shared across the three levels of government, like particularly to the state and the local government. But what has that translated to in terms of infrastructural development? Do we know how those funds have been spent and those information are readily available as against information on how those funds have been disposed? So you see, from time to time, we issue freedom of information requests because we really want to go to court and not because we enjoy just uh, taking the government to court. It is simply because there is not enough information as to what the government is doing with these funds to let the people know that perhaps it would need some time for these things to manifest. The information is not just in there, which means perhaps that some of these monies, perhaps also most of these monies, may end up in private pockets without the people not being aware of it. And that is why we've gone to court time and again to compel the government to do the right thing. One of the initiatives we've taken in the past few months was looking at the 2020 of the general report, which is very interesting, and I think all Nigerians should be interested in it. It's available on the website of the Auditor General of the Federation. And what the Auditor General does annually is to look at the inflows and the outflows, that is the income and expenditures of all government agencies, federal government agencies, and match the records of what had come in and what have been spent. And the Auditor General in the 2020 report, like he has done for more than 10 years, Raise the alarm that trillions of naira cannot just be accounted for. It's all arms of government, including judiciary. And, and this is worrisome. And that means for a government that is saying it is cash traps, that's begging Nigerians to uh, to keep the faith that things get better, a lot of money has slipped into the cracks and not been done about it. What is your pension to state government, uh, uh, to state governors and debit governors? What about the issue of security? The list goes on and on. Bottom line. These administrations have also fared, fared well in, in quarter one in terms of transparency and accountability in adherence to the rule of law. And we don't see anything that suggests that they are going to do better going forward. Of course, that, is not, that doesn't mean that Nigerians will give up. We need to continue to have these conversations empowering Nigerians to demand transparency and accountability, of course, well beyond the narrow prisms of politics and tribe and religion. All right. Uh, thank you very much for, you know, explaining all that and holding the government to account. And I'm going to bring in our in-studio guest to, as quickly as possible, talk to us about the excuse. Now, we keep on seeing in several administrations, Kaduna State Ubasani saying that he inherited a huge debt from Taksir El Rufai. And it's something that we see a, 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 an excuse that is repeated not just at the state level, but even at the federal level. Does this ex excuse hold water? And for how long are Nigerians going to keep listening to our leaders as they tell us that they inherited huge debt from the previous administration. Please go, yeah, please go ahead. Mr. Mecca. Yeah, so I, this, uh, early this morning, I went through an article that uh, said that Russia uh, might soon become the only country in the world without a debt, so a single debt. Now, Russia is making efforts to clear its entire debt. You know, how has it done that, you know, through you know, um, different measures by which it has, you know, consistently brought down its debt. And then the different challenges were listed in that article, and it was very interesting. Yes, uh, Governor Obasani coming to tell us that he inherited XYZ from uh, his predecessor. Very nice piece of news, but he should have, but that isn't an excuse, because um, that's not a tenable excuse, uh, because 
allocations to his state have improved since he took over. It's almost a year. So if he is telling us that, okay, he read so, 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 and so, and so, so, you know, these were people who were there. They were on ground defending uh, Eru Fai. You know, I, I remember one of the deaths, you know, one of the deaths was, some, was, was something that was oppo opposed by uh, former Senator Shea Usani. Right. He opposed it. But what happened? People shouted him that, no, 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 no. Uh, the governor is on course the, for development and all of that. And what, uh, what do we have today? The current governor is saying that those deaths have uh, prevented him from paying salaries and all of that. So I think the governor should put on his thinking cap. He should get down to the basics and find innovative ways of managing his state's finances without borrowing more. Mm, you see, okay. people, you know, the, the, the idea that Nigeria, you know, or the states, or local government can, local governments can keep borrowing is very, it's unhelpful. You get to a point, you have to have a threshold whereby you stop borrowing and you have to take care of your finances. You have to plug leakages and all of that. Curb corruption so that you can reduce your debt and then have enough money to take care of you know, the, 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 the responsibilities of your administration. All right. Well, this conversation is one that uh, would likely have to um, continue. But then again, finally, in 30 seconds or less, Mr. Kolawole, very, very quickly, if the ultimatum uh, is reached, what next? Uh, we would have to go to courts because the law empowers us to compel public institutions to disclose information to the members of the court. Right. Unfortunately, we would have to go to courts. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kolawole, for joining us. Uh, we always appreciate uh, you uh, anytime you, you do find time to join us and uh, carry on this conversation on what Serap is doing. And also, thank you, uh, Mr. Emeka, uh, for also being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll go for that quick break. When we come back, it's Which Way Nigeria on a Monday. I woke up to news that the Naira has gained enormous strength as $1 now exchanges for 500 Naira. And like that wasn't enough. The Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria have announced a sharp reduction in the pump price of petrol from over 600 Naira to what it was a little over a year ago, which is 185 Naira per litre. And the icing on the cake was the announcement by the Nigerian government promising that starting from 6 p.m. West African time today, Nigeria will have 24 hours uninterrupted power supply. Okay, like they say on social media, okay, okay, you don't catch me, Otikami. <laughs> April Fool's Day. But I'm sure you knew that already. Okay, I know the whole country cannot be like Abia State yet. But can we at least have maybe 20 hours of uninterrupted power daily? Or oh, that feels like I'm pushing it. Okay, can we do maybe like 18 hours? I'm starting to sound like a broken record when I talk about our power challenges. When Davido said, them go feel it, I'm now convinced that he was referring to our bank accounts and the impact that the elevated cost of power and the rising cost of living will have on it. But these things are not unrealistic. We're not asking for too much. We're asking for the barest minimum, actually. Power, basic health care, education. Welcome to the April Fool's Day edition of the Nigeria Report, where we bring you the latest on the country's quirks and quagmires. First up, in the land where inflation is more pre predictable than the weather, we have a groundbreaking study that reveals that Nigerians have become masters of the Naira news dive. Forget skydiving or bungee jumping or all those roller coaster rides. We're living on the edge, literally, every time we check our bank balances. Who needs adrenaline when you have the thrill of watching your savings disappear? Speaking of disappearing acts, this has become the reality of many Nigerians who feel the direct impact of insecurity. Parents send their children to school, bandits make them disappear. Between Chibok and Kuriga, reports have it that at least 1,400 students have been kidnapped from Nigerian schools. Now, on a much lighter but utterly ridiculous note, do you know that sliced bread is now selling for 1,900? Bread. 1,900 naira. Ha! Good thing the holy book says that man shall not live by bread alone. It's too early to be complaining. We have just begun Q2. Nigerian government, please, help us. As we celebrate Easter, marking the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Nigerians are asking to see a resurrection of the Nigerian economy to reflect the Nigeria that we ought to have. Good morning, Nigeria.
Wow, that was a strong one. As we see the resurrection, we hope the economy well, the will resurrect. Well, the Naira to resurrect. This is really not <laughs> funny times for Nigerians here. Maybe the Naira will resurrect uh, in the third year. Please, I, I'm begging. I, I'm begging. I didn't say. You know what? Let's share what's happening later today. today. 10 a.m. we do have Jasiri. At 12 noon, we have New Central now. And 10 p.m., it's tonight. You know, whenever I see tonight, I kind of like feel like, you know, singing. We're like, tonight, tonight. Yeah. Olive, we just we have to be happy. Are young. Honestly, we, just have, we to have to find happy. our happiness somehow. Because right now, we are going to face reality. Honestly. You know. It's been an absolute delight having you join us for this morning's episode of Breakfast Central. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again 10 times, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. West African time. Until then, stay safe. I am Olive MOD. And I'm Johansson. Thanking you for being here. Don't forget more programs coming your way. Until we come your way again tomorrow, uh, keep a date with us. Have Bye a good day. Now.